named Shahi sold his well to a farmer. Next day, when the farmer went to draw the water from that well, the man did not allow him to draw water from it. I have sold you the well, not the water, so you cannot draw water from the well. Are you joking? You think I'm a fool to give you all the water? I will report this cheating to Emperor Akbar. The farmer became very sad and came to the Emperor's court. He described everything to the Emperor and asked for justice. Virba, look at the keys and sort out the matter. Call the culprit here. Birbal called Shahi, the man who sold the well to the farmer. Why don't you let him use the water of the well? You have sold the well to the farmer. So, I have sold the well to the farmer, not the water. He has no right to draw the water from the well. Birbal smiled. Good, but look, since you have sold the well to this farmer and you claim that the water is yours, then you have no right to keep your water in the farmer's well. Either you pay rent to the farmer to keep your water in his well or you take the water out of his well immediately. Wah, wah, brilliant Birbal. I'm sorry my lord. Shahi begged for pardon from the emperor. Akbar ordered 50 lashes for Shahi and rewarded Birbal. The farmer was immensely happy because he could now use the water of the well. I am sure many of you are very fond of reading and watching the clever, witty and humorous stories of Birbal. Well, who was Birbal? Birbal was a courtier of one famous ruler and that famous ruler we are mentioning here is the Mughal Emperor Akbar. But I am sure you are tempted to question why we are suddenly talking about Birbal and Akbar. Well, in this lesson we will be focusing on the Mughal Empire to which Akbar belonged to. Now the Mughal Empire was the second largest empire to rule the Indian subcontinent between the 16th and 19th centuries. At its peak, the Mughal Empire ruled almost the entire Indian subcontinent barring few regions. But as students of history, it is not sufficient for us to learn only when the Mughal Empire ruled. We have to look at the roots or the lineage of the Mughal emperors. And from that, we also need to know how and when this Mughal Empire was established. So, it is this discussion that we will be taking up in this lesson. The Mughal emperors had two great lineages from the father and the mother's side. On the mother's side, the Mughals decided from the great Mongol ruler, Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan ruled between circa 1206 and 1247 CE and he was the founder of the Mongol Empire that ruled over great parts in Central Asia. The Mongol Empire was a huge one and it spanned across the modern day nations of Iran, Iraq and Turkey. But the Mughal emperors did not want to be associated with the lineage or the ancestry of Genghis Khan. This is because in order to be in power, Genghis Khan used to kill a whole lot of people. He massacred many people. There was a lot of bloodshed and violence in the Mongol empire. And it is for this reason that the Mughal emperors did not want to be associated with this lineage. 
On the other hand, on the father's side, the Mughal emperors descended from the great ruler Timur. Timur was the undefeated ruler of Iran and he was the founder of the Timurid Empire. The Timurid Empire also ruled over vast parts of Iran, Iraq and Turkey. And the Mughals were very proud of this paternal ancestor of theirs. And this paternal ancestor not just ruled over Afghanistan, Iran and Central Asia, but Timur had invaded Delhi in 1398. This also justifies the point why the Mughal emperors used to eye Delhi, why they wanted to rule the entire Indian subcontinent. So having learnt about this lineage of the Mughals and how proud they were of this ancestry, let us now look at certain representations of the sim. Since the Mughal emperors were very proud of this Timurid ancestry, many paintings were drawn to illustrate the sim. Likewise, we have an example here and this image shows us Timur and his descendants. In the center of this image, we have the great ruler of Iran, Timur. On his right, we have his son, Miran Shah. Miran Shah was the great great grandfather of Babur. And next to Miran Shah is Abu Said, who was the grandfather of Babur. Now let us come to the left of Timur. Who do we have here? Here we have Sultan Mahmud Mirza who was the great grandfather of Babur and next to him is Umar Sheikh who was the father of Babur and after him we see three other rulers and these three rulers are Babur, Akbar and Shah Jahan and in the same order we can see Humayun, Jahangir and Aurangzeb in this image. But while we talked about these ancestors of the Mughal emperors, we have been mentioning Babur quite often because we saw that he was the great great grandfather of Babur. This was the grandfather of Babur. This person was the great grandfather of Babur and this person was the father of Babur. So why are we constantly referring to Babur? Why are we having Babur as the central focal point in this discussion? This is because Babur was the first ruler of the Mughal Empire in the Indian subcontinent. So, Babur led the foundation of the great Mughal Empire in the Indian subcontinent and it is for this reason that we have been referring to all these ancestors with respect to their relationship with Babur. Before proceeding with this lesson, let me ask you a question. Who was the first Mughal Emperor? Was it Humayun, Jahangir, Akbar or Babur? Well, the correct answer is Babur. Babur led the foundation of the Mughal Empire in the Indian subcontinent. So, let us now learn about when Babur led the foundation of the Mughal Empire and how it happened. In the initial years, Babur had to struggle a lot in order to come to power. In the year 1494, he ascended to the throne of Farghana. And he was only 12 years of age at this point of time. So can you imagine how difficult it must have been for this young ruler to take care of his throne and his subjects. But Babur could not be the ruler of Farghana for long. This is because Babur was met with very stiff opposition and invasions from the Uzbeks that was another Mongolian group. And so, Babur had to eventually give up his throne. Subsequently, Babur had to spend many years wandering. And then, he conquered Kabul in 1504. Kabul is located in the present day nation of Afghanistan. But Babur did not want to restrict himself only to Afghanistan. 
This is because he wanted to carry forward the legacy of Timur. We learned that Timur had invaded Delhi in 1398. And so Babur also eyed Delhi and the entire Indian subcontinent as a whole. And finally it was in the year 1526 that he now gained control of Delhi. But do you think it happened very easily? That is to say, was it very easy for Babur to establish himself as the ruler of Delhi and the founder of the Mughal Empire in 1526? Well, let us now learn about that. In the beginning of the 16th century, the Lodi dynasty under the Delhi Sultanate was in control of huge portions of the northern parts in the Indian subcontinent. And during this time, it was Ibrahim Lodi who was the Sultan of the Lodi dynasty. But when Babur came to invade the Indian subcontinent, he was extended help by the governor of Punjab, Daulat Khan Lodi. And it was in 1526 that Ibrahim Lodi's troops were met with Babur's troops with an invasion from Babur at a place called Panipat that is located in the present-day Indian state of Haryana. A fierce battle took place here and Babur had the strategic advantage. Why is it so? Because Babur had advanced and very strong battle tactics. At the same time when Babur had come to invade the Indian subcontinent, he had come with cannons. So at the face of this invasion from Babur, it was very difficult for Ibrahim Lodi's troops to stand tall for long. And eventually, Ibrahim Lodi's troops were defeated by Babur's troops. And this now finally marked the end of the rule of the Delhi Sultanate in the northern parts of the Indian subcontinent. And now what came to being was the great Mughal Empire in the Indian subcontinent. The year 1526 marks a very crucial turning point in the history of the Indian subcontinent because it was in the first battle of Panipat that Babur had defeated the troops of Ibrahim Lodi and he brought the Lodi dynasty and the entire Delhi Sultanate to an end and he then went on to capturing Delhi and Agra. At this point of time, Agra became the capital of the new Mughal Empire that established itself in the northern parts of the Indian subcontinent. But it was not very easy for Babur to establish himself as the undisputed ruler in this region. Babur was seen as a foreign ruler. He had come from Central Asia from Afghanistan to be specific and so all the rulers of Indian lineage saw him as a foreign invader. They opposed his rule. They now posed a very strong challenge to Babur's rule which is why Babur had to lead various military campaigns against the rulers who were ruling the northern parts of the Indian subcontinent. So let us now briefly talk about some of those military campaigns that Babur led against the rulers in the northern parts of the Indian subcontinent. A very crucial thing that Babur did after coming to power was to defeat the Rajput confederacy. The Rajputs were a very powerful, valorous and valiant group and the Rajput clans ruled over great portions in the northern part of the Indian subcontinent. The Rajputs were almost the undefeated rulers. The Rajputs were almost the uncontested rulers in this region. They had established the Rajput dominion or supremacy in the region. And Babur knew it very well that if he had to control Delhi, Agra and the northern parts of the Indian subcontinent, he had to defeat the Rajput confederacy. 
and so the Rajput confederacy that was led by Rana Sangha and other allies of the Rajputs were defeated in the battle of Khanwa in 1527 and this was very important because with the Rajput confederacy being defeated in the battle of Khanwa in 1527 the Rajput dominion and supremacy in the northern parts of the Indian subcontinent was also demolished but Rana Sangha despite being defeated was still wanting to overthrow Babur he was wanting to defeat Babur in other battles now Babur knew that he had to do something in order to crush the Rajputs entirely and only by crushing Rajputs it would not be sufficient for Babur because he knew that he also had to defeat the Rajput allies and to this end in the year 1528 Babur laid siege on the fort of Chanderi and here he defeated Medini Rai who was one of Rana Sangha's vassals. So here in this map we can locate Chanderi which is a place in the Malwa region in the present day Indian state of Madhya Pradesh and Medini Rai was the ruler of Malwa and he was defeated in 1528 when Babur laid siege on the fort of Chanderi. So with this it was not just Rana Sangha who was defeated but one of his vessels was also defeated. So let us now quickly go over the points that we discussed about Babur in this lesson. The most important point would be that Babur established the Mughal Empire in 1526. So with this now began the rule of the great Mughal Empire in the Indian subcontinent and Babur being proud of his Timurid ancestry he wanted to take forward Timur's dream of conquering the subcontinent and then Babur demolished the supremacy of the Rajputs in the northern part of the Indian subcontinent and he did so by defeating Rana Sangha as well as his vassal Medini Rai. Now we also need to take into account the religious influence of the Mughal Empire in the Indian subcontinent. When the Rajputs ruled the northern parts of the subcontinent, this was under Hindu dominion. The Rajput rulers were all Hindus and so it was Hindu supremacy in this region that is to say it was Hindu supremacy in the northern parts of the Indian subcontinent under Rajput rule. But with the demolition of the Rajput supremacy now Islamic influence from the Central Asia entered the Indian subcontinent. And this Islamic influence soon spread in the northern part of the subcontinent through dressing styles, food habits as well as other cultural practices. So the sartorial choices, culinary choices as well as etiquettes and other cultural practices of the people living in the northern parts of the Indian subcontinent now came under direct Islamic influence. But how do we know so much about Babur's rule? He ruled so many centuries ago. How do we get access to information on his rule? Well, to this end, what comes to our help is the Babur Nama. The Babur Nama constitutes Babur's memoirs. And the Babur Nama provides us valuable information on the emperor's life, rule, perspectives on different topics as well as his worldview. As a learned Timurid, Babur wrote about the history of the people and the geography of the places he conquered in Babur Nama. He also talked about his statecraft, the various military affairs, about the lives of the people in Babur Nama. 
and it is from this we get to know about how Babur ruled as a ruler, what perspective he had while he conquered the Indian subcontinent and his entire world view that shaped his various ideas. Successful as he was as the founder of the Mughal Empire, Babur was not able to rule for long because only after a short rule of four years from 1526 to 1530, Babur died that year. So Babur died in 1530. Nevertheless, he founded the Mughal Empire in the northern part of the Indian subcontinent that was eventually expanded by the subsequent Mughal emperors. So having been introduced to the Mughal Empire, how it was established and who established the same, in our subsequent lesson we will learn about that Mughal emperor who succeeded Babur after his death in 1530. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly. Learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it's rewarding too. So register for free now.